<laughs> I like that. Hello, everyone. This is the first episode of Chop It Up. It's a panel discussion show where we, the panel, myself, and my three friends, Michelle, Barry, and Urbano, will discuss popular topics, unpopular topics, current events, past events, anything we fear, anything we figure we can put our hands on and give you our opinion. There's a lot of panel shows out here in the world and we think they do a great job getting their opinion across. We think they do less than a great job getting our opinion across. So that's why we're here to give you our opinion. And today we're gonna introduce ourselves and we'll start with Michelle, like we will usually start with Michelle in most things. Michelle, how about introducing yourself to the people? All right, my name is Michelle Fortier. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in practice in the state of Florida with a um, focus on people that are involved in the criminal justice system, uh, especially uh, focused on people coming out of the prison system. I also do a lot of DBT work and I work with sex offenders that have released into the community as well. I also have my own YouTube channel um, where I go over mental health topics. Could you please uh, elaborate on what DBT stands for? DBT is a special kind of therapy where we address, um, it's called dialectical behavioral therapy, and we address issues with self-harming behaviors, addictive behaviors, emotional dysregulation, and interpersonal effectiveness skills, and distress tolerance skills. So all things that a lot of people that um, are involved in the criminal justice system have a difficult time with. So... Now, for everybody at home or on the road or wherever it is you're viewing this, you may ask yourself, huh, why is Michelle on this show with her experience dealing with people in prison and getting out of prison? Well, the answer to that will come in the rest of our bios. Mm -hmm. Barry, how about introducing yourself to the people? How you doing? My name is Barry Stevens. I'm 49 years old, former and denizen of the great state of Florida's Department of Correction. I did 30 years, 30 contiguous years, so not to be mistaken with in and out. And as Robert said, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about a lot of things, but not many of them relate to my situation or my circumstances. And for other people that are in like why situations, I would like to put something out there for them. You know, I went to prison when I was 17 years old. And due to the current Due to the state of the laws at that current time, I had no other, they had no other option but either life or death. So I was forced with the life sentence. And then due to changes in the laws, I was able to have a chance at redemption. Awesome. Uh, Rebus, how about your story? Good morning. My name is Urbano Rebus. And I, like Barry, also did 34 and a half consecutive years in the state of Florida prison system and all went in when I was 17 years old. But as he said, at the time the laws were that I either got a life sentence or the death penalty. So I received the, the life sentence. Matter of fact, six consecutive life sentences. Changes in the law. <laughs> I was to uh, be released and I have a lot to share about them 34 and a half years, but that is for a later episode. All righty. My name is Robert LaFleur. I too was convicted of murder, a very senseless and tragic crime. When I was 16 years old, I faced the death penalty and was sentenced to life. And due to changes in the law, I too received the benefit of a resentencing and was eventually released from prison. I would like to add that we, Rebus and Barry and myself, are part of a drastic minority because while the laws changed and the law affected 455 people in the Florida prison system, only about 60 ever received the benefit of resentencing because in Florida, the liberty that was granted by the United States Supreme Court turned out to be only a hiccup before the Florida Supreme Court reversed itself. And um, that's something we'll get into later on. And I would also like to introduce the rest 
of us, meaning a more complete bio. Uh, I'll start with Michelle. Michelle is our voice of reason because out of all of us, she's lived in the free world the longest and has the most experience being responsible. Barry is our secondary voice of reason and the calming presence here on the board. Rebus is our usual and resident cynic, as you'll find. And me, I guess I'm just the, uh, I'm here for comic relief. And um, that's about it. I come, I'm left-handed and I usually come from left field. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there anything yeah, anybody would like to talk about today? Okay, we can talk about time management since I found myself here at the um, tag agency when it's filming time because it's just not enough time to do what you want to do, especially with this coronavirus situation going on. So now you have to squeeze everything into an even smaller amount of hours. I couldn't find enough time. That's one of the biggest issues I found getting out was managing time because it appears you know everything on the set schedule and then you have hours and hours and hours of nothing. Whereas out here, you have work, you have other obligations, you have relationships, and, and I just can't find enough time. That's pretty feasible. Uh, I try to break it up where I do a different thing each day, and even then, I run out of time for the different thing, for the different task, you know? And I'm not even working right now. He was? Well, hmm. that, that was his other half talking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we here at the DMV only to be thwarted by the evil forces of government. This car agency. Bureaucracy. Yeah, well, it's the car agency. I can't even, I can't even blame it on the government. It's this car agency. They never yeah. transferred the titles over. So therefore we can't get the decal. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you something I would like to share. You know, I try to tell as many people as I can that I've been to prison for more than one reason, primarily because I feel like I am a representative of the people who are still in prison and who got out of prison. You know, Michael Jordan once said that he played hard every night because it may be the only time that someone in the stands has an opportunity to see him play in person. And I try to tell everybody that I'm in prison because I may be the only person that they ever encounter that tells them that they've been to the joint. You know, there's a lot of guys that try to just put it all behind them, ignore it, forget about it, you know, and I try to act as a representative. Now, there are times that I wait and tell them later, but when I'm interviewing someone as far as being a personal trainer and I'm doing the, the fitness screening, trying to find out what their goals are and things like that, I tell them I've been to prison because they need to know. We're gonna be one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. you know what I mean? So they need to know I've been in prison. And also, I'm in the business of making money. And if they find out I've been to prison, then they'll think I've misrepresented myself and they want to get the money back. So instead of being in the business of giving the money back, I like to earn money, have money, and spend money. So I tell them I've been to prison. Yeah. And, and yeah, I can't get the decap because it's still in the um, dealer's name. Barry, you might want to mute. Yeah, no, yeah, this is yeah. good. This is good. <laughs> Damn it. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <What's all right? laughs> we don't anyway. need your personal information coming out. <laughs> what? Uh, anyway, all um, of a sudden we know Barry's social. Yeah. Huh. Uh, <laughs> don't fear me. When people find out I've been in prison, more than likely they say, "Wow, you don't seem like somebody who'd be in prison." So the first couple times this happened, I said wonder what it could be. Maybe I'm too intelligent to have been to prison. Maybe I'm too even-headed to have been in prison, you know, even-tempered. Uh, maybe I'm too insightful. Maybe I'm too funny. What could it be? So finally I asked, I said, what is it about me that seems like I didn't go to prison? And they say, oh, you're not angry. Well, listen, I'm free. <laughs> what the hell do I got to be mad about, right? I mean, I drive where I want to. I do what I want to. Now, if they would have ran across me four or five years ago, I'd have been pissed the fuck off. But now, what do I have to be angry about? You know what I'm saying? 
Do you guys ever get that from people? Oh, oh yes, I get plenty of that. But going back to uh, where you started at, I also inform people that I've been in prison. But with my situation, as far as work, I'm around a lot of families. And oh, I want yeah. to make it known to them about my situation. Therefore, they can't say that I, I didn't inform them or something like that. But for the record, like I said, I have no probation, no pro, uh, no parole. I have no sex charges, anything that would do that. But I just like to be, that's as a disclaimer to let them know. Therefore, that gives them opportunity to say whether they want me at that job or not, or to move their kids somewhere where they're not around me or whatever. But also the other thing you talked about, it seems odd that when I tell people about prison and how much time I did and the crime that I committed, because I want to be upfront with them, that way they won't say that uh, I misled them or I took advantage of them or whatever. But my whole point was that the reactions I get are from left field to right field, all in between. And especially some of the same things that uh, Robert said is that they seem uh, to think that they've been watching too many prison movies, too many prison TV shows, and they expect all these crazy things to come or my way of thinking, especially when I tell them I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't go to bars, none of that stuff. They're like, now they're looking like me like I'm an alien or that I may, I may have not done any time. I'm just saying that for whatever reason, it's not like I need some street cred to tell people, Hey, I had six life sentences and I did all this crazy stuff for you to accept me. I don't need it like that, but it's just a, a, a disclaimer. And, and that way they have the information because I did, I, I had an interaction with other people that didn't tell people that. And then the next thing, you know, friendships or, or, or relationships were broken because they said, well, you didn't tell me about that. Had I known that at the beginning, I would have never interacted with you. And that's part of what we get into the future because about the reentry, and that's going to be a big uh, obstacle to get over, especially at the beginning of reentry. Hmm. What about you, Barry? Yeah, well, my the biggest thing is not because they think I'm too much at all, but it's the the humility. If I had to be that I could be so humble. I'm like, I would never would have guessed it. And I'm like, why? You're getting choppy. I mean, the name of the show is Chop It Up, but I was not using it that way. Huh? I say your audio is, is getting chopped up. Oh, oh. I was saying the, the biggest issue is my humility. People find it hard to believe that I've been in prison for 30 years because I'm still humble, you know? Oh, so, you, so you're supposed to... So so basically, you're supposed to be angry all the time, too. Exactly. Right. Instead, I'm appreciative. I'm enjoying life every day because, hey, I'm free. As you said earlier, I can do what I want to do. It's so nice to just get up in the middle of the night and go to the fridge and, and get you a cold drink. I mean, the simple things that people take yeah, for granted. Right. Like showering barefoot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the way shower slide. Oh, here's, yeah. here's another oh, one too that, um, that I always interact, and then they find out after I tell them all this, I also explain to them two things. You know, they say two things that should never be spoken about is about religion and politics. And this is just for you, Michelle. I don't, I don't want to wear it right now, but can you see this? Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, listen, hey, um, I'm a big Trump supporter too, right? I support anybody that wants me to put mop water in my veins. <laughs> hey, but listen now, but you know, this, this is the hey. other thing too. So when they- Shaving cream me, feels cool, maybe. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that I interact with them, I tell them about uh, religion and politics, and they say, well, they shouldn't be spoken about. I said, but how can you not speak about those two topics? More people in the world have been killed in the name of those two things. Sure, sure. But, but also, I tell them because I, I want people to understand that 
whether you like me or dislike me, it doesn't matter. As long as you dislike me or like me for who I am. Right. That way, at least we all understand because I don't have to like you to respect you. And that was one of the biggest things I had to overcome because as far as the re-entry possible, every person that I went to go get a job or ask them for help and they told me no, I had to look at it from their position. They may have thought there was other worthy candidates that didn't have the record I had or weren't willing to just take a chance because all they saw was the first to be murder charges. Right. And I asked myself, if I was in their position, would I take a chance on a first degree charge or would I take a chance on a person that wrote a bad check? Well, so more those are part of the interactions. Well, see, more than that, when you consider it from the other side, from the employer's perspective, if there's numerous candidates and they have a free and clear record, whereas our record has a blemish, you really have to understand that they're not holding it against us. It's just part of a fair evaluation process. You know, who really being objective is going to say, I would much rather take a chance on this guy who has a 36 in Rebus's case, 30 in Barry's case, or 31, almost 32 year hole in our resume when there's this other guy whose resume is free and clear. So yeah. until the industry is given an incentive to hire guys like us, then the best thing we could do is work for ourselves. Michelle, do you encounter any kind of bias out there when you tell people about your experience working in prison and how you interact with people getting out? Well, generally, most people are very curious about what I did, my opinions on things. Um, I found that a lot of people ask a lot of questions, and I have found that a lot of times people have a good amount of stereotypes about people in prison, out of prison. They, like you said, they have a big misconception about people coming out, the risks involved in people coming out, uh, how to mitigate those risks. Uh, it's amazing that people think that just simply because people get out of prison that all of a sudden all their issues are healed, all their um, baggage is now gone. When in fact, we sent people that had a lot of issues into a broken system. And for some reason, we believe that that broken system is going to fix broken people. And then they come out and they still got problems. And so it's amazing how um, warped people's thoughts are about the prison system what occurs in the prison system, the rehabilitation of the prison system, and the problems that uh, people still have when they come out. So Yeah. There's a lyric in a song by uh, an artist named Noriega. It's called, the song is called Nothing. And in the song, he says that most people only know about jail from watching Oz, the show that was on HBO. And that's really how it is. And yeah. And worse than that, and I'm just going to speak on this for a moment, there's a lot of YouTube personalities, a lot of YouTube shows, and I think YouTube is great because it lets us do what we do too right now, and they sensationalize prison in yeah. such crazy ways. First thing I would like to say is this. I know there are, not that I know personally, I know there are a lot of guys in prison that have cell phones, and that is a felony. So if you are watching this show on a cell phone, that's cool for you. Do you? We don't need to know. Later on, we'll give an email address and maybe some other information where you can reach us and give us some topics that you want to hear us talk about. And if you are in prison, keep that to yourself. Respect what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Don't put it on blast. You know how to kick it, man. Write it saying, hey, a friend of mine is in prison. A friend of mine has this problem. You know what I'm saying? We don't need to know that you are in prison on a phone. Keep that to yourself. Keep that to yourself. Let me just get that out the way. Um, and that's, um, and this is something too, is uh, people that have loved ones in prison, sometimes they're not always informed by their loved one in prison what actually goes on so even people out here that think that they know what's going on because they have somebody um that is incarcerated they don't always know what's going on either 
because well, sure, their loved one doesn't want to give them all that drama, all that information and make them worry. Or some of the stuff that goes on in prison, some people really don't want anybody to know about. Some, sure. There's some really bad stuff that happens. So, and what? what I've also found is there's lots of layers. So you have different groups in prison and the experiences is, is um, each person's prison experience is unique. So you have the, some YouTube channels where they concentrate on their experience and their experience is gonna be different than, than y'all's experience. Very right. different. Okay, but I was watching a, a, a channel cause you know, I've, I've got YouTube on my television. So I'm sitting in here watching YouTube and there's this guy and his thing was five things every convict needs. So I'm thinking, well, hell, let me see what this guy's talking about. So the first thing he had was a <laughs> screw about this long to put on a shank. And he said, oh, everybody's gotta have a shank in prison. You know what I mean? You gotta have one, oh, which oh. really is a misconception. And the second thing he does is he pulls out this, this piece of plastic tube and he says, and everybody needs a suitcase, you know? No. So this guy is telling people that if you go to prison, you need to have something to stick in your ass. And I don't know what the other three things were because I turned that show off. Yeah, yeah. And that's definitely. the thing, is everybody's experience is so unique. It depends well, for those, of, for those of you watching at home, you definitely don't need anything to stick in your ass to do time, okay? You don't need it. Yeah, that's not part of that's not part of the plan. It, that comes in that yeah. comes in the optional package. Yeah. Now there are guys in there that are doing it, but uh hey, it's not necessary. Everybody's experience. No everybody's experience is very, very different. It depends on what camp you land at. It depends on what you were rolling with out on the street, what kind of dirt you were doing out there, what you're dragging with you. Ma Michelle, you don't wake up one morning and just say, I want to stick something in my butt. No. Right. But There's I mean, a lot of stuff that goes along with yeah. that. And, and I mean, it, takes, know, it takes a whole lot more than somebody else saying, hey, you need to put something in your butt. <laughs> I mean, I can understand. Everybody. Say, I want to get up and play handball. I've never played handball. OK, you try something new. Yeah, but everybody's like, doing it. Yes. Yeah. And, hey, look. Um, all the all the cool guys got something stuck in their butt. You just don't know. <laughs> the, uh, I never want to be cool. Yeah, I want to be hot. <laughs> hey, that, that is the proverbial third pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know about that, but oh, hmm. another thing that I I wanted to say is uh, what you uh, talked about, Michelle. About everybody's experience is different. I understand that, but one thing that is. 100% across the board is the lack of freedom. Oh, yeah. yeah. Once that happens, how you deal with it is all a different thing. Because as Robert was saying, in the Fed system, if you look it up on YouTube or any or just Google it, they have people that make money, they put out a pamphlet, how to survive in prison. Yeah. And one of the things they do I don't know where these guys are trying to have, but they're like talking about things that have nothing to do with prison. I don't know where they came up with this stuff. And my like thing what? is uh, something <laughs> like some crazy stuff. I'm talking about, I don't even want to talk about it. That's not crazy. This We're not even going to dignify that. Yeah. When you get an opportunity to Google it, and it's called the survival kit for prisoners. And once you get that, we will comment about that. Okay. Yeah. But let me ask you this, since you're the, 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 the therapist and you had all these guys come to you while you were working in prison, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that they all told you about either they, how they were having problems dealing with it, or as we know, most people in prison self-medicate, whether it be smoking marijuana, drinking, doing pills, pornography, however they deal with their their problems, their stress, or did they actually think that there was something different? Because, for example, oh my I God, Barry's gone. gone. Okay, Barry's back. Okay. Okay. I don't know. He or something. All the time, I want to go home, and I would give a crazy look, say, "So you're saying that I don't want to go home?" So, 
how yeah. did you deal with all these guys coming to you about dealing with your stressors? With the stressors? Yeah, bring back. So, what is it exactly that you're asking? Okay. We just segue from how guys all had different experience in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but wh what what is all the same is we're all in prison doing time. Yeah. And the, it's like the old joke says the, the judge guy gave a guy 30 years in prison, and he told the judge, I can't do all that time, sir. You're on, I can't do all that time. He said, son, just do as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, that's how they do. They check out. But in the process, they come and seek out help through religion or, or the uh, psychological department, and they ask about all their personal problems. But if no matter what the personal problem is, they have to find a way to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. And my question to you is, what was one of the common themes that you heard concerning doing this time? The biggest thing, because I would ask people that did a lot of time, uh, how you do your time? How do you manage it? How do you, how do you figure out how to manage everything that you're going through? And then I would give that knowledge to people that were coming in at the beginning of long sentences, at the beginning of life sentences. And the advice that I had gotten the most from people that have done a lot of time is don't look at how long you have. You look at each day as it comes along. Don't ever look at how much you've got to do. You only pay attention. And what we would also talk about is finding hope that something will change, that something will occur that will give you some relief from the courts. So that was another big coping mechanism. And for people that had life sentences, a lot of them, I would give them Viktor Frankl's book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, about finding meaning in the suffering. So that was, that was very helpful too. But people had a wide variety of coping. You had some in the beginning of their long sentences, they were very angry. They were very, um, you know, they did dislike authority. They didn't want to follow the rules. They were just mad at the whole system. And Sounds then like my dog. <laughs> yeah, and then after a few years, after going CM a few times, after yeah. stabbing a bunch of people, all that drama, they'd eventually settle in. And they'd say, okay, this is my life. This is what I got. Let me make the best of it. So it was a pretty typical pattern. I hope you don't recommend that book to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> what book? Just what, reference. Man's Search for Meaning? Yes. Why? Do you know he committed suicide? Victor Frankl did not commit suicide. Google it. He did not commit suicide. <laughs> Google well, it. listen, man. Even Albert Einstein made one mistake. <laughs> Victor Frankl, I believe he died of cancer. Look it up. See, you're I'm not sure. Right I'm, now. sure. I'm sure. But anyway, but no, I understand what you say because I read that book. Yeah. A uh, Jewish guy was in concentration camp, was a psychiatrist and all that. And he did do, and all the things that you, you just spoke about, that's one of the things I did in that one day at a time, the AA concept, one day at a time, because mm -hmm. the past is gone, the future isn't here. What we have right in front of us is today. And think about it, 34 and a half years. Wait, 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 let me interrupt. Uh-oh. Uh Frankl died of heart failure in Vienna on September 2nd, 1997. He is buried in the Jewish section of the Vienna Central Cemetery. So Rebus is saying he willed his heart to stop beating. That's all. <laughs> Suicide. <laughs> Shit happens. Go, go um, ahead. Go ahead, Rebus. Sorry to interrupt. No, I just had a he kept, he knows mac yeah. he kept eating those macaroons knowing his cholesterol was high. <laughs> yeah. Suicide. Death by fried food. He yeah. was also born. He was also born in 1905 and died in 1997. So he he was uh what? What does that make him? 92? 92. 92. 92. Yeah. 92. 92. So, uh, yeah, uh, it was a pretty long life. So he figured out how to kill himself on the slide. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it went on for years, 92 years. Yes. Yeah. But, but that was a good insight as far as the process because that's one of my personal stories. But like I said, in the future, when we talk about the reentry, it uh, what most guys don't understand is that it's a process. 
Yeah. They want it to be a vision from one day to the next is going to all change. And that's not what happens. Okay. Because, but one of the first things that what starts the whole process is a commitment to change. Because I, I tell people when I was in there, I would tell them that, hey, look, you give me advice and experience about how to be a successful criminal, but you ain't here with me. Therefore, you're not a successful criminal. No. no. Secondly of all, the idea, their fantasies of how this process would change them overnight was not realistic. And, and therefore, all you had to do is look at the recidivism rate. And me personally, I can't find a reason to go back to prison. There's nothing I left back there that's worth going back to. At all. Yeah, they sent me most of my property where they didn't steal, so. <laughs> I left all of mine. The only thing I took was some pictures and uh, an address book. I didn't even get my last couple of dollars they had on, on my little card. They told me, um, oh, yeah, you pick up your money at the front gate, and they put it on the card in that envelope what they give you with your, your release on package. And then when I get, like, I don't know, probably about, 40 minutes away from the prison, they called me and said, oh, you were supposed to go to the warehouse to pick up your money. Okay, well, why everything else was at the front gate, but I had to go to the warehouse to pick up my money. I said, you know what? Have lunch on me, because I won't be seeing y'all no more. <laughs> I, I, I even left those yeah, they didn't want to keep the rest of that stuff, so they put it at the front gate for you. They want to keep the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They had their priorities right. Yeah. Money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, uh, Yep. But I like I like the concept about hope. That was that was the biggest changing point in my in, in my incarceration period was when I started having hope. I said, you know what, hey man, I, I'm living like I'm never getting out of here. I'm living like I got a life sentence. I said, well, if I don't want, if I want to get out of here, I need to start living like I want to get out of here. So I got to start preparing myself mentally yep. first, and well, that's when everything started getting smooth for me. Instead of hope, I embraced reasonable expectations. I saw that laws were changing. I saw that concepts were evolving and I expected them to trickle down to us. In 2003, I read an article where they were attacking the juvenile death penalty. And with my nuts and bolts understanding of the law and the concept of equal protection, I knew that if they were gonna change that, that they would have to, the change would have to trickle down to everybody else eventually, you know? So it wasn't so much hope for me as it was just a reasonable expectation that we were gonna benefit some kind of way. Well, mm -hmm. I had one of the things that I, uh, one of the books, beside, beside the Torah or for the Jewish, you know, that's the Bible, you know, five books of Moses. Besides the Bible, for me, the most impactful book that led me to this process was the law of attraction. And it's similar to what Robert said, even though uh, 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 people used to call me by an adjective name that I had in a program called Reasonable Rebus, I used the reason everything, but here's the thing that made it very clear to me that it was important to, to look at it that way. It was everything that I was attracting to myself. And like Barry said, I started seeing myself free. I got to the point, right, like the last six months before I got out, besides being in the county jail, but I mean the last six months in prison, anybody that spoke to me, all I told them I was going home, I was doing, the, all these things were happening. And little by little, everything did, uh, I did attract everything that I needed. I attracted the people that were going to help me, the lawyers, the, uh, the programs, the uh, services, all these things to come out and it happened but it was an everyday occurrence that i got up when i went to when i got up i thought about it when i went to sleep i thought about it and it was all about okay today if i were if i were to be released today i told myself where would i live who would be my hey, contact people all this I, hate stuff. To, I hate to yeah. cut you off but we got less than a minute left you have to save that for next time does anybody have any contact information that they want to share? If anybody wants to contact this show, give us a topic or give us some kind of feedback, 
You can contact us at listlessgenius at gmail.com. That's L-I-S-T-L-E-S-S-G-E-N-I-U-S at gmail.com. Michelle, do you have any contact info? Yes, I have my YouTube channel myself, and that deals with mental health topics, and that is I Am Free, Now What? That's right. the name of the channel. Barry, you got any contact info for anybody? Well, you can always hit me up on Facebook, at, and my own Facebook name is Barry Stevens, so it won't be hard. The same name is on the show, my original name. All right. And, Rebus? and my, uh, you can hit me up on Facebook. My, uh, it's, it's Urbano Rebus, just as you see it. All right. Well, it was great having everybody here today. And uh, hope you'll come.